Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Foundations of Computing. Today is pretty exciting because you've now gained all the basic programming skills you need to start to learn extra things on your own. So you're no longer just bounded by the material that we have taught you in class. So today, we want to give you one of those new skills and help you see how you can take what you've learned from programming in Python and use it to learn a whole new set of programming languages, a whole new set of skills, and in fact, to start building the internet. So one thing that we'd like you to come away from today with is the ability to start building your own very first web pages. This is what was originally in place in the very, very early days of, well, what was not even the internet then, what was called the ARPANET. Now, this was a network of a couple of different institutions, a couple of different universities and one research institution that were joined by physical cables, uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, UCLA, SRI, and uh, the University of Utah. Physical links between them, and this was all that the internet was a couple of places connected together in December of 1969. Now, of course, that did not stay the same for very long. Just a short time later, the cables were put in place to physically connect Utah with MIT, BBN, which was a consulting firm, and Harvard. And you can see that Harvard now has a link all the way to the RAND Corporation, which is an interesting public policy and strategic thinking firm uh, that was over in California. Um, and these were now connected in a larger network. Now, of course, each of these organizations internally would have had more than one computer. Inside each of these institutions, there would have been a network. So when we connect multiple networks across long distances, well, that's an internetwork connection. Or if we shorten it, that is the internet. Now, again, this did not last very long because everyone thought that this was a brilliant idea to allow computers over long distances to talk to each other. And so pretty soon, something different developed with a much larger range of users at a much greater range of geographic distances. So this is from one of my favorite networking textbooks. And you can see that pretty quickly, we had a mix of internet service providers, big corporations, large corporations, all being connected together at what we call peering points. And these are just places where different wires come in from all the different places and then go out further across the world. Now, one cool fun fact is that most of the world's internet traffic is actually carried by very large cables that are, anyone know where they are? Under the ocean. These are called submarine cables. So you have these uh, very large ships that carry cables that then get sunk to the bottom of the floor of the ocean and connect places as far as like Sydney and Los Angeles. There's actually a cable running all the way under the ocean between those two points. And this was how the early days of the internet functioned. Now, when you use the internet, you probably have something a little more like this in mind. So you have your desktop computer or your phone in your pocket. Somehow it connects to the internet. And then at the other end, there's what we call a server. Now, a server is really just a computer, but it's a computer that we have specialized to performing certain tasks. And those tasks are typically to remain on the whole day and all of night, and it responds to requests from these clients. So if a client says, hey, Mr. Server, can you send me my file? The server will send back the file over the internet. And you can, uh, I sometimes run my own computer as a server, it's not a particular piece of physical thing that makes it act like a server. It's the instructions that we've told it to do. So if I put this laptop in my office, leave it there all night and all day, and tell it to respond to requests on the internet, it becomes a server. Now, of course, sometimes this language does get used to refer to the products that are marketed at servers, because you might want to design a computer with components that make sense for that. Maybe you don't need a screen for a server. Maybe you just want to connect to it remotely. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's just a computer like the ones that you have been using. Now, one thing that we've kind of hidden away in this picture is, well, if there are a whole lot of cables crisscrossing everywhere, how does the message get from the client to the server? Let's say I want to connect to google.com. I don't have a physical cable running from this laptop over here all the way to Google. So that's where we need 
something called routing. Someone at the back of the class, I need a name from someone in the last row. Okay, glasses at the very, very back in the jumper. You're looking around, you're looking left, right? Yeah, you, what's your name? Uh, Harry. Harry, okay, and remind me your name at the front? Peter. Peter, okay, Peter, I want you to get a message passed all the way to Harry. How do you get the message to Harry? The message is attack now. Okay, assuming that you have to go through all the different links between you and Harry. Oh, uh, wait. And we'll actually pass the microphone for this. So, like, maybe, like, say, attack out to that person over there. So, say it into the microphone. What do you f do first? Attack out? Attack out? Like. So, you have to figure out who's next to you, right? Yeah. Because you can't pass the microphone directly to Harry. So, find out who's next to you. Do you tell him anything, or you just hand the microphone? Yeah. What do you tell him? Uh, pass the message attack out to Henry. Yeah, so pass it to Gabriel. Pass the message attack, attack what? Attack now. Attack now. We're trying not to play a game of whispers. Okay, yeah? Pass the message uh, attack now to Harry. Pass the message, attack now to Harry. Uh, you guys can do this a bit faster. Sorry. Pass the uh, message, attack now to Harry. Pass the message back to Harry. Uh, Wait, what is? Fight. Attack now, okay. This message is getting lost pretty fast. It's your turn. OK, our message has gotten lost. Um, do you want to just pass the microphone back one? Yeah, you want to grab it? Forgotten your name, sorry. Pass the message, attack now to Harry. 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 Pass the message again to Harry. The passengers to the Harry. Pass the message attack now to Harry. Harry? Attack now. <laughs> <laughs> that works. Okay, round of applause for everyone. So there were a couple of things we actually needed to know in order for this to work. So everyone had to know who their neighbors were, so who the next people that it would be to whom it would be possible to pass a message. They also had to know that those people would eventually have a link back to Harry. Um, but this was also difficult because we didn't have an easy way of figuring out like who to pass next to. And this is where we developed a scheme for the internet to do something similar to pass messages around called TCP IP. And if you want to learn a lot more about this, you can come take my third year class on information security. But the basic idea here is we have two different protocols that work together. And uh, IP, the internet protocol, uh, sorry, not the trans transmission control protocol, I have to get that right. Um, and the internet protocol, IP, that are designed to work together to enable us to do routing and to pass the message all the way along. So TCP handles things like making sure the message gets there in one piece and actually allows me to set up a longer term connection with Harry so that I don't have to go through and reset it up and figure out the new way every single time. Um, and then the internet protocol is actually going to help me make the decisions or help each individual person make the decisions about where to send the packet next. And this is what we call next hop routing because at each step of the journey, the person with the microphone, the person with the message was making the decision about where, what the next hop should be, where the next place would be to send the message. Now, this was also difficult because not everyone in the room knew who Harry was. We'd seen him over there, but we had some blank faces like, Harry, who's Harry? Now, that's obviously not gonna work on the internet because every computer on the internet is not gonna know where all the other computers on the internet are. So we're going to need some ways of figuring it out. Um, and this we'll do through the internet protocol. Now the internet protocol 
is also known as IP. And has anyone heard about anything to do with IP before? There's something, an IP, IP address. This is the kind of addresses that computers use on the internet to help us with this routing problem. So instead of having a name, we can give them an, a 12-digit number, and this 12-digit number will help us figure out where to send things to next. The details of exactly how that works, again, we're gonna have to save for a later class. So let's assume that it's gotten to Harry, and Harry is running Fortnite, and Harry is running his web browser, and Harry is running uh, WhatsApp on his computer at the same time, and the message comes in attack now. And Harry is not sure whether that message is meant to be displayed in his web browser, in his Fortnite game, or in his WhatsApp call with his mum. Um, now, attack now might be more disturbing if it came in at that last segment, so it was probably meant for Fortnite. But the way that we actually allow computers to figure out to which program on the computer a message is determined comes as part of TCP. So TCP has a, adds a part to the message that says it is meant to go to a particular port. So just like in a physical dock, a physical marina, has lots of different ports that things can go in at, and you can receive different types of things at different ports. The same thing happens on a modern computer using TCP. And two of these ports, which are numbered, port number 80 and port number 443, are reserved for the kinds of traffic, the kinds of messages that you would display in a web browser. And we call these HTTP and HTTPS. So if, hopefully all of you have seen when you type into a web browser, what's an example URL? What, what do you type into a web browser? Maka. Yep, and that'll tell our web browser where we want to connect. Our web browser will send out the message to the server, wherever comp101.com is, and then comp101 will hopefully send it back, and because we've used HTTPS, it'll come back to Maka's computer on port 443, and so Maka's web browser, Maka's computer will know, oh, this is meant for the web browser because it came into the computer with a tag saying it was meant for port number 443. So here's a sample IP address. In fact, this is a real IP address of a computer that I actually manage somewhere in Philadelphia. Um, so if you want to try and get into it, feel free. I don't think you'll find anything there. So now we have another challenge, is that Maka wanted to go to comp101.com, but we just said that the internet uses these IP addresses, these numbers, to try and actually um, figure out how to get messages across different paths. So this is where we have another protocol, which we call the domain name system, or DNS for short. And essentially what this is, is it's very simple. It's a table that looks something like this. Um, and what the table is, is it has a list of every website and every IP address that corresponds to that website. Now, you might think of this, well, there are lots and lots and lots of websites in the world, and we don't want one computer to have to have the entire list. And you'd be very right about that. So what we do instead is we start dividing up this database across different computers, and the DNS system figures out how to get the answer to what IP address you're looking for. And so now when you want to connect to this, what your computer will do is it will first send out a request to an IP address that it knows, so let's say it sends out a request to address 1.1.1.1 with the message, hey 1.1.1.1, do you know where I can find comp101.com? And 1.1.1.1, if it has a copy of this, it'll respond, yes, I do know where it is. It's at 158.130.4.1. So now we're actually at the point where we have the address of the site we want to get to, but we need to figure out how to get that site to give us what we want. And this is where HTTP comes in, the hypertext transfer protocol. And so what I want to, what we're going to go through for some of today is how to build your own website that'll respond to these requests using HTTP, and that we're going to write in a language we call HTML, hypertext markup language. So HTTP, sends HTML documents over the internet. Hypertext transfer sends hypertext markup. 
Now, you will have seen when you connect to a site, oftentimes you'll see HTTPS instead of just HTTP. And this is because the plain version of HTTP doesn't have any security built into it whatsoever. What the S means is that's a signal to the computer that you want to add cryptography to the connection so that someone who is like able to get the communication part way through, so let's say I was sending my message to Harry, I don't want Gabriel to know that the message was attacked now because maybe Gabriel's on our Fortnite server as well. So the S is a signal to Harry that we're going to set up some cryptography to garble the message so by the, by the time it gets to Harry, no one else but Harry can read it. So now we're ready to actually look at our URL, our Uniform Resource Locator, that's what it stands for. And this is one that you might see pretty commonly, something like https dot dot slash slash www dot example dot com. And we can divide it up into different pieces. So what we call everything after the dot com here, after that slash, we're going to call the path. So just like there are different directories on your computer and different files within the directory, we're going to want to be able to navigate to different files located on the server that we're trying to connect to. So for example, there might be a folder on the server called path. So it could be example.com that tells us the computer and then slash path tells us where in that computer we're going. Or perhaps there's a file there called file.html that we want to open. Or, or another folder by a different name. And then we add a trailing slash to say, well, we want to open up that folder and look at anything inside. Now we could also place file.html inside that folder on the server, and this is the path that would enable us to get there. We call this part highlighted in uh, yellow the domain. So www.example.com is the fully qualified domain. It's the full domain that we need in order to figure out where we're going. So remember example.com is probably a computer somewhere, but we can divide this up further. So example.com is the top, is going to be uh, the, the primary domain here. The .com is what we call a top level domain. So there is going to be a big computer somewhere that has a database of all the different things that fit inside of .com. So comp101.com, example.com, fluffybunnies.com, all the different .coms are all gonna be in that DNS server. But maybe that DNS server doesn't wanna have to keep track of all the different kinds of subdomains that are inside example.com. So example.com might have a subdomain, www, and so example.com is going to maintain a potentially a list of all its different subdomains. So you could have www.example.com, www.fun.example.com, www.awesome.example.com, www.games.example.com, and those are all subdomains contained within example.com. So .com is going to maintain a list of everything that is directly under it, and then example will maintain a list of everything that's under example. Now the most common subdomain that you will see on the internet is indeed this www, which stands for World Wide Web. And this just goes back to the days where a server like example.com might not actually be giving you web pages. It might be doing different things on different subdomains. Nowadays, mostly we can just drop the www because everyone assumes that when you connect to a domain that you're actually going to be looking for HTML. You're gonna be connecting over HTTP. So now we're ready to look at what an HTTP request actually looks like. So we know where the server is, we know what port it's on, we've got all the other details, how do we actually ask it for something? And the answer is you send it a message that looks something like this. Um, so literally if you type this text in in an appropriate way and sent this message out, this would be a way to get back what is at comp1001.com. Okay, so we have our request for, uh, for getting a page index.html. Now one thing to actually know about the internet is if you don't ask for any page in particular, by default, what the server on the other side is going to do is normally to send you back whatever is inside this file called index.html. We also say which version of HTTP we're using and the name of the site that we're trying to connect to at that particular domain. So I'm gonna show you on the other computer 
what actually happens when we try to do this. So let's try and zoom in a little more. And I'm going to use a program that's built into most Mac and Linux computers called curl or C-U-R-L to figure out, to actually show this process. So I'm gonna type in curl. And then the dash I flag, which is just gonna tell the computer to give me, show me all the details. So we can see here that we issued a request for slash to host neverssl.com. That's the website that I was trying to connect to. And then I also sent some additional stuff as well, but that actually wasn't necessary in order to actually make the connection. This is all you actually need to send in order to get the page. Now, what happens when we send that is if everything's gone to plan, we'll actually get a response back from that computer as well. And that response will look something like this. So let's look at our other computer. Okay, we see HTTP 1.1200 okay. And I'm gonna now remove some of the extra information and it'll just give us that. There we go. HTTP slash 1.1, 200 okay, tells us the date, tells us some information about the server, tells us when the web page was last modified. Um, and it also tells us what type the response is going to be. So it's going to be text, and it's going to be text that represents, that's written in a language called HTML, and we'll talk more about that in a second. And so all of this information is called the header of the response. It's not actually the web page we were looking for, it's kind of the metadata about the web page we were looking for. And so there are a couple of things that I wanna point out here, and one of them is this thing at the top, 200 OK. So if you've made a successful connection, it's gonna return back a status code, 200. 200 is the status code that every server on the internet uses for HTTP to say that it's actually worked. And then after the header is gonna come the actual content, the body of the response, which will be the web page that you were actually looking for. Now, knowing what we do about the internet, there are other status codes than just 200 for when things go wrong. And here is a list of some of the status codes. So you might know a 404 not found. Who's seen a 404 error before on the, on the internet? Right, this web page isn't where, what you were look, where you were expecting to find it. There's also a 401. If you uh, are asked to log in and you hit the escape button, it'll say you are not authorized to view this web page, error 401. And this is how web pages tell your computer that a connection was either successful or unsuccessful. Now, Drea, take, Marco, do you want to pass the microphone? One of these is a little different from the others. Which, which one is it? Four one eight. Four one eight. What's four one eight? I'm a teapot. Is this a real HTTP status code? Hands in the air for yes. Hands on head for no. Okay, I've got a couple of heads and probably a few more hands. It is indeed a real HTTP status code that was originally an April Fool's joke, um, and so some of the engineers who run the internet. Uh, who like helped design the specifications for what the internet is, decided that it should probably be removed from all the places that it was put in as a joke. And then in uh, 2017, when this campaign was underway to remove it, an anti-removal campaign was launched to save the teapot, to save 418. Um, and so there was actually a large public response in favor of the I'm a teapot status code. So in, uh, in when was it? I think it was in 2018, the movement was successful, the plan to re remove 418 was dropped, and I'm a teapot finally became an official part of the HTTP standard. And indeed, uh, if you use Python now, and you use Python's built-in web server, you can actually get it to return the I'm a teapot status code. So now, everyone have a phone? Open your phone and visit this URL. And this is what you'd get. The requested entity body is short and stout. Tip me over and pour me out. So that's a fun bit of internet trivia while we're at it. Um, but now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. 
So we have our headers from our response for our server, but now we actually need the web page. This is what we've been dying for the whole time. How do we actually get a web page back from the internet? So here is part of an HTML document. And the format should look relatively approachable to you because of the kinds of indentation rules that you're used to seeing in Python already. Now, you'll notice that HTML has these kinds of matching things. So we've got HTML, slash HTML, title, slash title, body, slash body. And these tags are going to be the way that we delineate different sections of an HTML document in a hierarchy. So let's actually start playing with this. I know I've been talking for about half an hour now, but we haven't really done any programming yet. So let's turn to uh, the computer over here and actually see what happens when we run this bit of code. So I am using cs50.dev on this computer over here, which is just a built-in online programming environment that I've shown you before, very similar to Visual Studio Code that allows me to work in like a kind of pre-set up environment. And what I'm going to do is I am going to create a new text file. Oh, where did my terminal go? There's my terminal. And I am just going to start writing some HTML. So if we're being really persnickety, we should probably start our document with this doc type command, and then with a pair of open and close tags for HTML. So everything in here inside is going to be HTML. Let's do a title. Oh, I forgot something, actually. So this should all be in what we call a head tag. And a head tag says this is all information about the page that I want the web browser to deal with, but I don't actually want this displayed in the main bit where you see the actual web page. So you know how in the browser tool, in the tab bar at the top, it has the name of every tab? This title is what's going to be displayed in that tab. And so you, we're going to talk about some other things that you can put in head, but just keep in mind that that is going to be all the information about the page but that actually is not the contents of the page itself. The contents of the page are going to be in a body tag. So as is traditional, this will be our hello world. And I'm going to save this as hello world.html. So now I'm going to navigate to the right directory FOC, Weblec, and I'm going to run this command HTTP server. Now, this command does not come built in on every computer. Um, so in Visual Studio Code for CS50, cs50.dev, it is built in. I've also installed it on my own computer, and it's not too hard to install. But just so you know, if you want to get this working, the easiest way will probably be to visit cs50.dev and try it out there. So I'm going to run the command HTTP server. And what this will do is on the computer that's running this whole coding environment, it's going to start up some software that will now respond to any of these HTTP requests that we've been discussing so far. And conveniently, it'll also give us a domain name to go to. So I'm going to go to this domain name now. I think there should be a button for me to click it. Copy, I'm going to paste that in here. Ah, and there we go. We can see all the files, and there is hello world.html. There we are. There's our hello world. And that is how you make your very first web page, and I've just zoomed in here. And so if we look at our URL up here, so we have the name of the server, which is something very long and complicated that was automatically generated for us, but then we have the path as well, which is forward slash hello world dot HTML. Another thing that we might want to do using HTML 
is not just add um, data into our body, but we might want to add metadata into different parts of our document as well. Not just in the head, we might want to add metadata within the body, we might want to add metadata around the whole thing. And so here we can use HTML attributes and not just tags. So these pairs of open and closes are called tags, and within tags you can place attributes. So here's an example tag that I'm adding to let the browser know that my document is going to be written in English. So inside the tags closing and opening and closing angle brackets, I have an attribute lang, which is built into HTML, and I'm going to set it to en, which is the standard for when you want to indicate that something is in English. And this whole kind of hierarchical structure is going to make up something that we call the document object model or the DOM. And this is just a way of representing our document as a bunch of connected objects. We call an object that is one above in the hierarchy the parent, and everything under the one layer underneath its child, and then all underneath that are all its descendants. So just like in a family tree, how you have a parent, and then the child, and then the descendants are everything further on, or you may have multiple children, the same rule applies here. So HTML has two children, head and body. Head has a child title. And then all the way underneath that title, in, inside title is contained hello title, and inside the body is contained hello body. And you'll notice that we've actually put hello body and hello title in, uh, in elliptical shapes rather than in square shapes because they're not themselves HTML nodes, they're actually just the content within the HTML nodes. So they get represented slightly differently. Now, you might say, well, how do I know what all these different tags are, what all the different nodes are, what all the different attributes are? Well, there's documentation for all of this. There are the formal standards that are long published documents that have a list of all of this. But there are also some helpful websites available to kind of get you started, um, that give you guidance to some of the easy tags. And the best one that I have found is the Mozilla Developer Network Web Docs, or MDN Web Docs, that are located at this destination. So we are going to take a very quick look at this website, then we'll take a bit of a break, and we'll get back to building slightly more sophisticated web pages. So let's go to developer.mozilla.org, and this is the website. And they have a whole series of resources. So they have the references, which is just the, the full unvarnished details of all the different things that you might look for in HTML. But they've also got some basic guides. So let's click the basic guide for the minute. And so they've got an introduction here. And then they've got a whole thing of like what's in the head, how to do the basics of text, etc. So if at any point you get confused, you can either go into the reference here and look at some of the, all the different tags that are available, or you can go into the guide that might be a structured way of helping you to learn. And with that, we'll take a little break until uh, 9.58, and then we'll come back, we'll do some more HTML, and we'll set you on the road to building your own home pages. Thank you, and I'll catch you in five minutes. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are now gonna keep moving forward with building our own web pages. So we've got Will over there with the microphone and he's gonna tell us what is making me a bit unhappy about this particular web page. Why am I sad? Hmm? It's too big? I, I couldn't hear what you were saying. It's empty, yeah. There's, there's not much in it. Um, now, what are some of the key things that we'd hope to see on a web page? Yes. Color. Yes. What was the main thing that we interact with on the internet? Links. Right, so that's, that's one of the huge things that we're missing, is right now all we have is a static page. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't look like anything, it's missing content, but it's also missing a way to navigate to different parts of the internet. If you visit any web page, you are almost always, I can't think of one web page that I know off the top of my head that doesn't have any links. So that makes sense. For our next exploration is we're gonna add some additional tags 
to our repository of what we know about to help us to do things. And the very first of these is going to be the link tag. And these are going to be designated with an A and then have an attribute href. Now, what we do is we're going to put the inside that href attribute, we're going to put the destination of where we want this link to go. So let's go back here to our code and I'm going to add an A tag and I'm going to make this go to comp101.com. I'm gonna, there we go. And you see it's closed that tag, so I'm gonna save this and see what happens. And now, let's reload it. It hasn't done anything. Will, what have I done wrong? Can you see? What's, what's inside the link? Is there anything inside the link? There's nothing inside the link, so there's nothing to click on. We haven't told it to make anything in particular link. We've just said make a link. So what should I probably do? Put something to click on. And we've already got some text there, so it would make sense. Maybe let's make the hello world a link. So now let's save that and visit here again. Oh, there we go. That looks a bit more familiar. And now if I click hello world, it'll hopefully, oh, that didn't work. It'll hopefully take me to http dot dot slash comp 101com That's what I was missing. OK, so let's do this again. And there we go, there's our comp101.com. Now, you've all seen that website and we're bored of it, so let's make a new one over here. But we're gonna need some new interesting tags to kind of make this fun. Um, and so maybe the next tag that we'll look at is the image tag. So image SRC, and that inside SRC for an image tag is going to be the location of the image itself. Now there are kind of two big ways to do this. One is to have all the images on the server itself, and the other way is to actually give it the URL of an image that's somewhere else on the internet. So let's go to Google Images, and what, do we, what, what would be a fun thing to put, a fun picture to put in our, Will, what do you want to see on the web page? I knew it was gonna be a cat. I should have come pre-prepared. Okay, so let's go to Google Images and find ourselves a nice cat one. Which one do you want? The cu a cute one, okay. Let's put in cute cat. Let's put in ultra cute cat. Um, and let's, let's do this one. So this cat is not actually free, unfortunately, but we can still possibly, I'm gonna pick a, a more random website because some of these websites will actually block us embedding the image. Here we are. That looks like a pretty cute cat. Oh, thank you, there we go. So super cute cat, let's get the Link, thank you for letting me know that that wasn't appearing on the screen the whole time. Okay, so we have our cute cat. Image src equals whatever the URL of that cat was. Let's save it. Now with a bit of luck, hello world, giant super cute cat picture. Now that's a bit too big for our web page um, and is a bit frustrating, so you know what, let's add another attribute. Let's add height is 500, Ooh. and width equals 500. And save that. Oh, I didn't close it. There we go. I'm missing. See, Rithik shouldn't be doing this. All of you guys are in class. You have to let me know when this is happening. That'll be nice and small. There we go, 50 by 50, now we have a mini super cute cat. Okay, so HTML is what we actually call a markup language rather than a programming language. Because looking at the structure of what we've just done, 
there's no way for us to actually put in an algorithm. There's no if, there's no, there's no like true and false. There's no actual computation going on. What it is, is it's a way for us to specify the design of something. And so using what you've learned from programming languages, you can still work in a markup language, but you don't necessarily have to do the same type of thinking. It's a different sort of process because you're thinking about layout and design rather than logical flow. There's also a particular markup language called markdown, which is a bit of a pun. And this is a very common language used on the internet to write text files and documentation rather than having to actually write something in Microsoft Word, which is very complicated, you can write a text file using a language that's not altogether that different from the kind of way that HTML is structured and produce nice looking documents very quickly and easily. But, Will, there are still some things missing from our web page. You had some critiques before. What's the problem still? Color. Color. And When you, when you make a nice document, what are other things you think about other than just color? The alignment, the font, all of these different things which come under the heading of style. Right? We want our page to look stylish. So we're going to start learning how to add style into our, um, into our web pages. So this is going to be our welcome to CSS. But before we do that, one thing we're going to learn is just a couple more HTML tags. So in order to kind of do this styling, we're going to learn about some tags in HTML that interact with the styling. So the first of these will be the H series of tags and the P tag. So the P tag stands for paragraph, and the H tag stands for header or heading. So let's go ahead and modify our hello world.html and turn our hello world link, we're going to get rid of the link, and we'll turn that now into an h1 heading. And then I'm going to add an h2 heading. This is an awesome subtitle. And we can still have the cat picture. But I'm going to have a paragraph. Uh, we are so glad you could join us here. And now let's see what happens. OK, so starting to look slightly better. We have a little bit of distinction on our page. We've got the image in there. We've got the awesome subtitle. And they're all formatted slightly differently. This is by default. Before you add any of your own custom style, what most web browsers, how most web browsers will render or convert the markup language into a visual appearance, what it will actually look like. But to get it to look nicer than that, we're going to need another markup language. And this one is called Cascading Style Sheets, or CSS for short. I never remember these acronyms off the top of my head. Very often I find myself looking them up again by, before class or a week before to kind of refresh my memory. And the way that cascading style sheets work is by specifying how to style different types of tags and different types of elements within your document. So one way of doing it would be to use style attributes. And so we could actually do this. We could style the particular h1 element there, and we could style the particular p element there. And so let's go ahead and do that. Style equals color blue. And then for this one, I'm going to be do style equals color red. And I'm sorry if you're red, blue, uh, um, colorblind. So to help for those people, we'll do this font size 14 pixels large. Now let's see what happens. There we go, and 14 is actually smaller than the default, so now awesome subtitle appears smaller. And you can look up all of the different style tags on the Mozilla, on the, all the different style properties, is what we're going to call them, on the Mozilla Developer Network reference that we showed before, so you can find out how to make things 
uh, in different fonts. You can find out how to rearrange things using style. All the different things that you want to do with style are going to be different CSS properties and different settings. And so the way that we're setting our CSS properties is by having this kind of notation with uh, the name of the property, a colon, and then the value of the property, and then a semicolon to specify that we're up to the next one. But you can imagine this is going to get clunky really, really quickly because now let's say I want to do another paragraph. that says, isn't HTML fun? And now I've had to copy that style again. And whenever we see kind of repeated code, we know this from our Python experience, when we see that, that's an indication of code smell or something that we should be doing a little better. So CSS does give us tools to actually improve on this and actually put all the style that we want together, either at the start of the page or even in a separate file, and then specify things for everything of the same type. So for all of the different P elements, we might want to say every paragraph should be in red, every H2, every heading 2 should be in blue. And so what we can do now is inside our head tag, we can add a style tag. And in this style tag, we're going to write some CSS. And this style is going to be applied to everything on the page. So we could now write, OK, Select all the paragraphs, and this is how we select all the paragraphs, and then every paragraph should be colored red. And now I can get rid of this, and all my paragraphs will be red. Now something else I might want to do, I might want to make all of my heading twos blue and 14 pixels, so I can do this now. And let's do our H1s as well. And our H1s, I'm going to use a new property, text align. And I think it's American English, so it's center spelt like that. Now if I go to my page and refresh it, my hello world heading is now centered because it's an H1. All my H2s are blue, and all my paragraphs are red. So we've cleaned up our code substantially. Now, something else that we probably want to do in terms of our style, given the way that most people view websites, might be, well, what do you think? How do most people view websites? From their phones, right. So right now, this design is going to look pretty bad if you're on a phone, because a phone screen is not as wide as our web page. So our hello world is all the way at that point over there. And uh, the rest of our text is, well, our hello world is over here. And all the rest of our text is over there. And so what we're going to want to do is to give the phone some information about how to display this, or give the browser some additional information about what it should do. So now we add some code that you don't have to memorize. Certainly, you don't have to memorize any of this. When you're developing websites, you almost always have access to the internet. And so you'll be looking up stuff really frequently. But we're going to use some additional tags for metadata in our header. And so this one is going to be what we call a viewport tag, which tells the web browser how to actually deal with, the, with all the information. So I don't even remember this one off the top of my head. But what it's essentially telling the uh, computer is that we want to automatically make sure that everything can fit and do it at a normal scale proportional to the device. So don't start super zoomed in, don't start super zoomed out, but make sure that the content is fit to the width of the device. So now if I go in here and refresh it, we shouldn't actually see anything change because this is still a computer. Uh, but if I have, where are my browser tools? Web developer tools. Oh, not that one. If I go here, 
think this will be responsive design mode. Now, this is a feature of the web browser, and I can actually see what this would look like if I viewed it on a small screen, and you can see it still looks like it makes sense even if I was viewing it on that kind of thing. So I could select, I want to view this on an iPhone 11 Pro, and then it's going to show me what an iPhone 11 Pro screen would actually look like with my website. And this brings me to another useful thing that you'll want to have in your toolkit when you're developing websites is the web developer tools that are built into your web browser. So in this case, I'm running Firefox. You can do this in Safari. You can do it in Edge. You can do it in Chrome. Each of them have their own developer tools built in. And so this one that I just launched, this responsive design mode, is one of the features that's pretty common. Now, the other one that I want to show you is something that I did just before. So I went to Tools, Browser Tools, Web Developer Tools. But frequently, if you just right-click on the page, there's a button, Inspect. And so I'm going to click the Inspect button. And this opens up that window that I accidentally opened before. And now at the bottom here, you can see the HTML. And I know it's a little small, but um, we'll have to deal with that for the moment. So if I click on my Hello World, I can then scroll down. And then I can open up the paragraph to see what's inside the paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. And it has all the code that I wrote to, and will highlight for me what the code corresponds to in the actual page. Now, the other nifty thing here is on this side of the page, I can see my CSS. So it says, oh, you have had an H2 style tag applied from somewhere else in the document. So if I open up my head, I can see my style tag. And gray means it's not displayed. Um, I can see that there's my H2 instruction there. So if I click on my H2 on the right-hand panel, it's going to show me the H2 stuff as well. So now let's say I want to play around. And I, I'm like, what if this wasn't blue? I don't, that blue is a, a bit garish. I want to try a different color. And so in this panel, I can actually play around with it and say, well, now I'm going to make it this like greeny thing and update the color tag there. And I could also type in the start of a property, and it will auto-complete for me all the different kinds of properties that I could choose from. So let's try text decoration. I'm actually not sure what that property does. Didn't do anything of interest. OK, let's try another one. OK, let's do a property that I do know then, just text align. So we can center that as well. And now we can see my subtitle is aligned as well in the developer tools. Now, there are tons and tons and tons of CSS properties. You aren't expected to know them. I'm not expected to know them. Most web developers don't know them. You'll know the ones that you use the most frequently. And then for anything else, you'll kind of look it up. Now, we've been talking a little bit about CSS selectors. So this was how we actually figured out that we wanted all of this to apply to all the H1s or all the Ps, all the, all the paragraphs, or all the H2s. But there are other type of selectors that you can use as well. You can use the HTML attributes to actually select things. You can use the ID of an element, which we'll show you in a minute, or the class of an element. An ID allows you to pick out one specific element from the whole set whereas a class allows you to pick out a group of elements. And I'll show you how you can do this now. So let's go back to our code before. And let's say that I want to set a property for some reason that is the same for my H1 and my P for these particular ones. And I want to group them together. So what I can do is I can set a class for them. And so this will be class blue stuff, and then class equals blue stuff. Now, if I want to pick out all the things that are blue stuff, instead of just writing the class name, I'm going to prefix it with a dot. So blue stuff, background color, blue, for example. And this is going to select everything that has a class set of blue stuff and apply the property. And that's looking pretty ugly, but it does work. Um, but I also might want to, OK, let's add another, another P over here. 
We're having a great time. And I'm now going to give this particular element its own ID, its own name. And I'll call this great time. And now I can select out that particular element. So actually, let's see what happens first. If I, if I run it without any changes, we're having a great time appears below. But I actually want to single out great time. And so I'm now, instead of using a dot, I'm going to use a hash. And this picks out an element by its ID rather than by its class. And what I'm actually going to say is I don't really like the background color of blue for great time. So I'm going to make it white again. Now you'll notice something interesting happen. It goes back to white. Even though both blue stuff and great time were applied, picking out a specific element is more specific than picking out a group of elements. So CSS has a whole bunch of rules around specificity. The more specific you are in a rule, it will override anything that's less specific. So let's go back and make it text align center. Oh, there's me with my English spelling again. I'm going to delete the background color white. Now we'll see what happens. And now we have both blue stuff and great time both applied. So if I look here in my developer tools, I'm going to do inspect on this thing. And I can see that great time is applied and blue stuff is applied and P has applied. It's done all the selectors, but it's arranging them in a hierarchy from bottom to top. Bottom is least specific, top is most specific. And so as you, get, uh, as you move up the hierarchy of specificity, the properties at the top are going to override any conflicting properties at the bottom. Now, one other thing is that we may want to have the same style across a whole bunch of different pages. Let's say you have uh, your home page. Let's visit my personal page for a second. And I have a few different links here. But yet the style, oop, we don't need the CV, uh, but the style is the same across all the different pages on my personal web page. So we probably don't want to have to copy and paste that style block into every different page. That's going to be a lot of copied code. So instead, what we might do is we might have a file that we will create. And I'll create a new file here. Call it style.css. And .css is the way we tell the computer that this is going to have CSS rules within it. So let's open up style.css. And I'm going to copy everything that used to be in the style tag. Let's move that down a bit, because that's not helping us at all. Everything inside the style tag is now going to be put inside style.css. So let me refresh my page and see what happens. Oh, no. I don't have style anymore. Will, what's going on? Yeah, they're not linked. So I need some way to tell my initial web page about this style.css file. And the way we do that is with another tag in our head. So now we can actually get rid of these style tags in the head, because we're not using them anymore. And we can add a link, ta uh, a link tag that links these two together. And again, the particular reasons for these syntax are a little arcane, but this is the command that you would use to link a style sheet into the main file. So now let's go back to this. And we can see our style applied again. Now, it's still looking a little bit ugly, honestly. I'm not super happy with this. And I am not the world's best designer. But there are people who are somewhat better designers. And so it makes sense that maybe I'll sh I should be able to reuse their code. Now, one of the most popular sources of style code is actually um, a tool called Bootstrap, or a framework called Bootstrap, that comes built in with a whole lot of different styles that you might want to use. Um, and it was originally created by Twitter engineers. So let's look up Bootstrap. Here we go, Bootstrap, the most popular HTML, CSS, and JavaScript library. 
And it's a library just like in Python. It's got all these different built-ins that you can use to make your web page look nice. So I'm going to click Get Started with Bootstrap. And I'm going to see, oh, it's using the same thing as we were doing before. Um, is this the CSS file? Yeah. So it is using a link, except instead of a file that I have made, it's a file at a different URL. That's just a CSS file. So let me copy this over. Instead of my style, I'm now going to have this bootstrap file. And there's some extra stuff in here to help make sure it's really the right file, but we don't have to worry about that too much. Now all of my class stuff isn't going to be useful anymore because I've just removed my own style sheet. But Bootstrap is going to have some built-in styles for things like h1, h2, and p. So let's see what happens now. Oh, that's starting to look a little more designed, but we're still not quite all the way there yet. So if we go to the Bootstrap site, we can now go and see that they have all these different ways to make things look nice. So let's look at an example on Bootstrap. And uh, let's see. Here is an example of a page that can be made using Bootstrap. So they have a, two buttons, and they have what we call a centered hero, which is like a main uh, a main part of the web page that we're meant to focus on. So we can go to our developer tools and inspect this and see, OK, what have they done? And we can now start to see the different classes that Bootstrap is using to do these sorts of things. So let's just leave our design of our web page at that for the minute and trust that you can uh, start to look up different things to add more elements to it as it goes. But Will, I'm still kind of unhappy with this site. What is it missing? Other than the link. We can put the link back. Other pages, OK. What, what normally happens when, what's the most frequent site that you personally visit? YouTube, OK. And what happens on YouTube? Does it just provide you static information? What is there on YouTube's website? Videos. Videos and how do you make a video play? Buttons. Right? The web page is interactive. It's dynamic. And this is what we call front-end web development. So it's this art of both designing the web page using HTML and CSS, but then also including another language, JavaScript, in order to actually make it interactive. So this is the programming language that web browsers are typically going to support, and that's going to allow us to run code on the web page that's going to interact with our page. And so now I'm going to, we're going to do a very, very small bit of JavaScript, just enough to kind of get you started. But for actually learning JavaScript, that's something that you're going to do on your own. Um, and this is typically the way that programmers work, is you don't, off the top of your head, know every programming language that you're going to need to use. Instead, when you encounter a scenario in which you really need to use a new programming language, you already understand how to program. You know how to use if statements and else statements, else statements. You know how loops work. And it's just a matter of figuring out what is the syntax of this new programming language that we can then take the ideas that we've learned from something like Python and transpose them into the new syntax for this new programming language. So we're going to start adding in some very, very basic JavaScript into our web page to start to make it interactive. Now, a full class on JavaScript is obviously beyond what we have time for, and we aren't going to test you on JavaScript in your exam. But I personally felt that it was really, really important to show you this, to show you that the skills that you've learned this semester are transferable. What you've, you have learned Python, but much more than learning Python, you've learned to program. And that's a skill that you can use to build a web page just as much as you can use it to build a Python application. OK. So now what we need is a place to put our code in our web page. And the way we will do this is using a script tag. So open script, close script, and then typically we're going to write our scripts in JavaScript. So now frequently you'll see people actually omit the word JavaScript from their script tag, and this is because 
for the most part, web browsers largely only understand JavaScript, but it is also good, uh, good practice to uh, write the name of the language that you're going to use. And the way we do this is by adding an additional attribute to it um, that is type equals text forward slash JavaScript. So we'll do that now. And we'll go into our head. We'll do script type equals text slash JavaScript. And this is indeed the default. So now we're ready to actually write some JavaScript code. So let's start with the simplest and most annoying JavaScript you could write. And every line in JavaScript is actually going to be terminated with a semicolon. So that's the way that we tell the computer that our line of JavaScript has ended and that we're ready for the next line. So let's try this here. I'm going to refresh the page, and it gives me an alert. Hello, world. So we're already starting to write some code. Now, if I were to type by and put them on the same line, JavaScript's not going to care. Python cares about white space. JavaScript does not. JavaScript cares about the uh, semicolons. And if you take FOA next semester with me, we're also going to be using C, a language that also doesn't care about white space but cares about semicolons instead. And so this is a very common uh, feature of programming languages. So now we see hello world, if I press OK, and it says bye. But this website still doesn't actually do anything useful. What we really probably want, as Will said, is buttons. And we want the buttons to do something. So we're going to need to go back and we need to rethink things a little. So we currently don't have any buttons on our page. So that would be a good start. Let's add a button. And what will the text in the button say? Click me. Seems like a reasonable thing. And oh, where did I put that web page? There we go, click me. And now there should be a, uh, a bootstrap class that I remember. I think this is right. There we go. So there were two bootstrap classes that I just used there. Um, button and button primary. And now click me, but the button doesn't do anything. Will, why doesn't my button do anything? You haven't given it an action. Okay, so given what we've just learned about JavaScript, what would be the one thing that I could probably figure out to make the button do? Don't know. Well, we know how to make an alert in JavaScript already, so that seems like the first thing that we might want to make it do. So in script, we can type an alert, you clicked me. But there's still a problem. What, what's the problem? Someone other than Will, because I, I think we've given you a hard enough time. You want to pass it over to Tom, maybe? This is a routing problem all over again. You need some way to tell that the button's been clicked? You need some way to identify that the button's been clicked. Now, what? Do you already know how JavaScript and CSS work? Okay, so we'll give the question to someone else. What, what was your name in the middle? Uh, also, Will. Also, Will. Okay, so give the microphone to Will 2. You can be Will 1. Will 2, do you mind being number 2? Um, okay, so what method do we have to identify a particular part of my HTML document? So I want to identify the button. What tool have we already talked about that allows me to select the button? Um, the head. Sorry, sorry, the, um, yeah, the head section. So the head section is a section winner. We, we came up with some concept that allowed us to figure out, OK, I want this thing to apply to all of these items or apply to all of those items. How did we do that? Oh, um, we had the, the class. Yeah, we had CSS selectors, remember, and we had a couple of different ones. So you could select all the P elements or all the things of this class, or you could select an individual item by, do you remember what, how we selected an individual item? ID. ID. So what we could do is we could give this button an ID, and we'll call this the click button. And now, if I do something like the click button, I could write, wait, that's writing CSS, that's not right. 
but CSS and JavaScript can interact. And it turns out you can use JavaScript in combined with a CSS selector, this kind of this part of the CSS that identified a particular item. So I'm going to give you another command now that's built into JavaScript. And this is document.querySelector. And this will allow you to use some CSS to select something in JavaScript. So this command, is a this is a function. And what the function returns is whatever matches that CSS selector. So this function is going to return the button. And now it's probably useful. I'm going to add my semicolon. We're going to want to store the, the result of that function in a variable, just like we do in Python. But in JavaScript, we're typically going to create a variable using this syntax, using the word let prefixed before the variable name that we want to create. So let my button equal document.querySelector equals the click button. And then the way that JavaScript is going to work is there are going to be all these different events. So we could have an event for when we hover over the button, for when the mouse leaves the button. But really, the one that we want is going to be a, Will, what's in this case, which, one, which kind of event do we want? The alert. The alert. Well, when do we want the alert to happen? When you click the button. So what we want is when the button is clicked. So the syntax in JavaScript to set an event to do something is you do, let's say it's my button, my button dot click. And then the argument here is going to be what we want it to do. And what we want it to do is actually to run another function. So now stuff is going to start to get a little complicated because inside here, we're going to write a function. And the function will be alert, you clicked me. So let's help make this a little clearer by putting the function here and calling it function my alert. So now we have a function called my alert. And when my button.click happens, we want to run my alert. And instead of def that we use in Python, in JavaScript, we're going to use the word function. And then instead of having um, indentation that determines when a function begins and ends, we are now going to use these um, curly, bra uh, curly brackets. And to specify the arguments, all the arguments will be specified in just a regular set of parentheses. Now, we don't need any arguments for this. Um, and so we can go directly to the body of the function, which is just going to be that alert. Now let's see if I've actually gotten my JavaScript right. Refresh the page, click me, and I've gotten something wrong. Oh, my button is null. You should always read the errors. This means it hasn't actually selected my button successfully. No, this is, this is correct. Um, what I think is probably happening is that this JavaScript code is running before the page has finished loading, which means we need to add a little bit of extra code to make that happen. So what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to move the script for ease of, for, e, for our ease. I'm going to actually move it out of the head, and I'm going to move it into the body. And that actually does work. There we go. You clicked me. So I'll explain what was happening just then. So normally, the, the web browser, in order to make things appear as quickly as possible, is going to read the HTML document from top to bottom. And when it read that script that I wrote, it hadn't yet created the button. And so it didn't actually know what my button was when it ran that command. Now, there's a bit of JavaScript code you can add to make sure that that JavaScript code only runs once the rest of the page is loaded. Um, and I'm going to look up what the modern way of doing that is because uh, it changes every few years. And that I think the most current way is window.onload. OK. So, Apparently, the most modern way of doing this is the following code. So we'll add that in. And I'll put this here. 
temporarily. And this is just code that, like I'm doing, getting from somewhere on the internet, you would probably look up as well. So what this does is it says, only run the code inside of here once the page has loaded. So once DOM content loaded happens, when that happens, run this function, and inside that function is all my other code. And so just like I did here before, I could write a function set up other code doesn't take any arguments. And then over here, I could swap that out for set up other code. Now there's still a problem because set up other code has been created after I've used it, so I actually have to put this before. So if I put that there, set up other code, and then I add an event, so when the DOM content is finished loading, set up other code will run. But I do not expect you to be able to do this under exam conditions. I do not expect me to be able to do this under exam conditions either, unless you have a computer and the internet, in which case maybe it'd be fair. So now let's run it again. Click me, and then we can see you click me works, even though now I still have my script tag at the top. So this is the way of starting to create some interactivity. Now let's move this back over here. Now there are a whole bunch of different events that you might consider using or setting uh, in your code, and these are just some of them. So for example, you can set a, uh, something to run when the user releases the mouse button on the click or when the user presses it down, so even before they've let go. And that's different from a click, which is the whole action of down and then up. Um, we can also do something when a particular object is loaded or when the user types a key. And you can go again to the Mozilla Developer Network reference um, and start to look all of these up in order to figure out how to get the different kinds of behaviors that we see in the modern internet. Okay, so we'll do one or two more things. Um, so, oh, Will B, Will too has got the, got the microphone. What else do you frequently do on the internet? Think about when you visit, on a new computer, you visit uh, hotmail.com or gmail.com, what do you need to do? Set up my emails, set up my accounts. How do you do that? Uh, inputting data. Okay, before, before we get to that stage, what, you visit the web page, it says, welcome to Gmail, right? On a new computer. What do you have to do before you get anywhere? You have to sign in, right? You have to input some data, and there's typically a form that you fill out, and that form will then process your information. So our next step is figuring out how to actually get some user input into this thing and not just produce output. And so that's gonna be our next couple of minutes is talking about HTML forms. And then hopefully in next lecture, we'll start talking about how to actually deal with that data a little more, in a, a bit more of a sophisticated manner. So let me go here and I will open up, um, let's see which of these would be good to do. Okay, so let's say we want to create a registration form for our users. We're going to have to introduce some new types of HTML elements in order to do that. So let's go back here. I've got another uh, HTML document set up, and this is going to be register0.html. So we'll need to change our URL a bit, and this is going to be our registration page for whatever we're trying to set up. So we have a new tag here, and this is a form tag. And now we're going to add some elements to our form tag. So what are some things, Will, that we might want to have in our form? Uh, the name. 
your name, your, your email address. What else needs to be at the form at the very, very bottom? Yeah, the very bottom, at the end of the form, after the user's entered in everything. Uh, or a submit button or something like that. There needs to be a button. So a form is gonna have places for input, a submit button, and then we need some way to tie that submit button back to an action that the form is going to do when the submit button is actually clicked. So I'm going to add in some of these. So I'm gonna add in an input, and this can be an email, and I can add in another input, and we'll call this one um, username, and I can set all of these different attributes that are specific to input items. So the placeholder can be enter your name here, and then can make type equals username. Now there are a whole di bunch of built-in types, so I'm going to try one more, and I will make this password. Should I have a placeholder for the password? Probably not, because the user wouldn't be able to see it if it's one of those normal password dialogues that uh, creates those black circles when for every character entered. So type, and there's gonna be a password type. And then at the bottom, I just have a register button. So now let's go here and change my, whoop, change my URL to slash register zero. There we go, email, enter your name here, and then we can see that automatically for us it's created the password box in the form of the normal kind of password entry that uh, you have with those circles. We didn't need to write any particular code to do that, just setting the input type to password was enough to do that. Um, and then now I've got my usual form, you can ignore the password manager stuff. Let's see at I don't know, hotmail.com. Oh, that was meant to be my email. And now it still does nothing, Will. Nothing's assigned to register. Yeah, I, I haven't actually added any code yet to kind of solve this problem. And so I think that is probably where we're going to leave it today, other than to note that what we're really missing at this point is the back end. We've talked about front end development, we've talked about how to write code, but we want to probably interact with some database, with some information that's stored about the user. We want this user's login to persist so when the user navigates away from the web page, it's not just the code that was on that web page, it's actually stored somewhere on that server. And this is all back end development. And next lecture, if we get to it, we're going to learn a little bit, uh, well, not next lecture, next week. We've got an advanced lecture on Friday, but next week when I'm back, we're going to learn about a framework, a library for Python called Flask that will allow you to write a backend in Python and then connect that up to your HTML, CSS, and JavaScript on the front. Thank you very much, and I will see you all next week.